Hey Pacifica Locals, we're here at Aaron Gregory's studio in Sharp Park and Aaron is the mastermind behind this year's Fog Fest poster. So let's take a look at some of his work and hear about his process. In um, reading about cotton crustaceans, it was kind of interesting because you took a variety of um, not only skills but passions from your life to create this business. Right. Can you talk Bye. about, yeah, can you talk about sort of your, your, your past and how you got into art, but also how you combined your, your passions into creating this business? Sure. So like a lot of young kids, I grew up loving sharks and dinosaurs and science. Um, uh, my mother and art uh, and aunt took me to the, you know, Sacramento zoo. I grew up in Sacramento, uh, so we'd go there, or we had a giant fish store called Capital Aquarium that I would eventually work at in my teenage years. Um, uh, they would drive me here to the Bay Area where I'd go to Cal Academy, you know, California Academy of Sciences, back in the old, old building. Do you remember the alligators in the pit? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the cool reptile house area. Yep. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts. Um, and the big million gallon roundabout aquarium. You know, I could sit there all day and watch that. Um, so I think a lot of those experiences really planted the seeds for my passion and love for science and the natural world. Um, and so I started keeping aquariums as a kid and was kind of obsessed with it since I was probably like eight. Did you go um, out and collect lizards out in the yard and all that kind of stuff? I went stuff? out and more... collected uh, aquatic life. So we'd go fishing and I'd catch like crappies. Um, uh, I had a creek behind my house growing up, so we'd I'd go catch crayfish, um, put them in my wagon, and then try to put them in tanks, you know. Um, and so, and I, I'd keep, you know, crappies and crayfish and anything I could find in my aquariums in my bedroom. Um, and then eventually, you know, jump on my BMX bike and cruise down to the local fish store <laughs> with like four dollars in dimes and buy some, you know, kind of somewhat exotic tropical freshwater fish and put that in a tank and figure out how to keep it alive. And I think at one point I had like eight or nine aquariums in my bedroom when I was probably like around 10 years old. It would drive my dad crazy because all the air pumps would be going at once. And it was just this <laughs> constant vibrating den, you know, from my room, um, shaking the house. So, and that led to pretty much as soon as I was old enough, as soon as I turned 16, I got a job at the local pet store, which had a really big fish room. Um, and I learned a lot from a, a um, the manager there. At was, what point did your family have the fish store? Was that that so it all kind of leads up to that? So yeah, that, this is before that. Yeah, this is before. So this is a, so I turned sixteen, legally able to work, get my first real job at a place. You know, I was a lifeguard at fifteen and a half because you can do that in California. Um, turned sixteen, got the job at the, the pet store, started running the fish room, and really learning about just the basics of biology um, and ecosystems and how to kind of control them and how they how they work and balance. Um, and that led to a job at another fish store, which led to a job at another fish store. Um, you know, and so I pretty much kind of rotated through most of the fish stores in Sacramento as I grew up um, and eventually ended up at Capital Aquarium, the place I went to as a child. Um, and from there, I met someone who wanted to sell an aquarium maintenance company, which I was about 18 at the time. No, yeah, I was about 20, a little, a little older. Because um, I remember celebrating by drinking a beer. I just was about to turn 21. So we bought the business, I had my beer, um, and I ran around Sacramento cleaning aquariums for a living. Commercial and residential? Yep, commercial, residential, private homes, businesses, you name salt it. Salt water, all of that. Yep, salt water, fresh water. I even did ponds, which was miserable, especially in Sacramento. Um, yeah, stinky the, and the super heat. hot. And, yeah. You know. um, and then from there, I that led to me acquiring a fish store, uh, one of my favorite fish stores, one I had worked at when I was younger. Um, when I was about 18, 19, that's where I worked. Um, that fish store went up for sale and I came back around and bought it with my aunt. Um, so I was about 22 when we bought the fish store, which is young and crazy to try to take on. Yeah. Um, Super ambitious. Yeah. Um, and that store was called O Street Aquarium. Um, 
it was definitely ambitious. It was I was a little over my head. We both were. Um, and sadly, we also bought the store a week before 9-11 happened. So we, you know, we got the keys September 1st, um, and 9-11 happened, and that really crushed the disposable income hobbies. Yeah. You know, so fish stores, hobby stores, train stores, anything like that, they just plummeted. People just, you know, stopped spending any kind of disposable income. Yeah, for the all, most part. We all went inside and... Yeah, exactly. We grieved, right? yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, so we can only get by by selling food for the fish that people already had and the occasional people that were still willing to pursue the hobby, but it just wasn't enough. And um, uh, we, we gave up the store, gave the keys back, and I started back up with my aquarium maintenance company. Um, and that led to... What was interesting, the why I owned the fish store, when I owned the fish store, this whole time I was in my metal band called Giant Squid, which was really starting to get attention in Sacramento. And we hooked up with a, uh, a famous producer to come record the record. And he came to the fish store and thought that was a kick that we rehearsed <laughs> in the room because I lived in the apartment above the fish store. So he came to listen to our songs above the fish door and, uh, you know, it, it, from there, once once the fish store was kind of out of my life, which was a sad thing for me, it did open up more time for me to pursue the band. Um, and so while I continued to do aquarium maintenance in the city, um, the band kind of got bigger. We got a record deal. Um, and so we decided to move the band to Austin, Texas, um, to, which is, you know, kind of a music capital, yeah, right? right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and Sacramento was getting really expensive at the time, so we wanted to maybe go somewhere else and see if we could do something big with the band. Um, but as soon as I got to Austin, I of course started working for like a huge aquarium company called Aquarium Environments, which was one of the, it's still one of the biggest aquarium maintenance companies in the, in the whole country. Um, so fish and marine biology was just constantly in my face. Um, Giant Squid, our, our metal band, was metaphorically about the ocean, using my, my knowledge of biology, marine biology, to kind of metaphorically tell tales of the human experience, the nautical vibe, and big heavy riffs. Yeah. Um, the band did great in Austin, my job was great in Austin, but for various personal reasons we decided we should probably come back to Sacramento Bay Area, um, one of which was the joining of who is now my wife, um, Jackie Gratz, she, who's a pretty well-known cellist. Um, she joined Giant Squid to play cello. That was all I needed to hear to move back to California. Um, and so we moved to San Francisco because that's where she was located. And the band continued to, you know, get more and more popular. We recorded um, another record together with Jackie, which has kind of became our iconic record of our career called the ichthyologist which is somebody yeah, who studies fish the correlation there <laughs> yeah yeah um and so that did really well for us we got another record deal with another record label um but a lot of the inspiration the lyrical content that i came up with for the ichthyologist um came about when i got a job as a professional scuba diver and a aquarium biologist basically at aquarium of the bay which is here in San Francisco at Pier 39. Um, so I spent my days in these giant 150 foot long, 25 foot wide aquariums surrounded by massive balls of anchovies and eight foot <laughs> seven gill sharks and seven foot white sturgeons and bat rays and leopard sharks and enormous giant black sea bass. Um, so I'd spend two to three hours a day in that freezing bay area, you know, San Francisco Bay water, which was pumped into the tanks, um, vacuuming and scrubbing and cleaning and feeding the animals. Um, part of it was quite often a little bit of what we always kind of laughed to say that we were shark wranglers. Yeah. Professionally, we kind of were shark wranglers. We had to survive in there. With us. Yeah. The sharks generally didn't mess with us too much, but we had to give big feeding presentations. So the crowds would fill in the, the tunnels that went into the tanks. And they would watch us feed the seven gill sharks by handing out uh, steaks of salmon. Um, so there'd be one diver 
both of us would be pinned against the wall. One diver's handing out the food with, you know, kind of tongs as the sharks swim in. And the other diver has this kind of a PVC, and I don't want to say a spear, but just kind of this barricade made of PVC that we would use to push the sharks away if they got too rambunctious. Um, you know, or if too many of them came in at once, it was too hard to manage, we could push them away. Seven gill sharks are, they're really big and they're powerful. Um, and they're kind of grumpy. So, especially when they're hungry. Especially when they're hungry. And I have a, a small bucket filled with salmon hanging off my belt between my legs. <laughs> yeah. It gets a little squirrely. And, and there were some hairy moments. There's times, different times in the year where the sharks get really kind of randy. And, and, I mean, and is there crazy. a mating season? For yeah, sharks? it's kind of around that. Okay. And I forget what it is now. I want to say it's either November or February. It was around in that window but the sharks behavior changes and we got chased out of the tanks a couple times yeah for sure we just got overwhelming sharks biting the back of my tank and yeah getting between my legs to try to get to the bucket and and we're talking 200 250 pound animals um with big teeth with, with yeah significant teeth for sure big mouths you know just big powerful very it's a beautiful species. It's a very prehistoric species. Um, and it's one of the biggest predators we have naturally here on our coast in Pacifica and also in the San Francisco Bay. They go into the bay quite a bit. Um, the only thing really bigger than them would be the occasional six gill shark, which kind of looks like a seven gill. It gets bigger. And gray white sharks, which we, we now know come into the bay quite a bit from recent studies. Yeah. And video. And video. Yeah, right. The video of it attacking that seal. Um, so I would, you know, be on my knees cleaning and feeding animals, coming up with these lyrics for giant squid, <laughs> um, which was fun. And so the ichthyologist did really well. Um, but at the same time, I was kind of hustling. There wasn't a lot of money in being a professional algae scrubbing scuba diver. But that position now at that aquarium is volunteer based. So... Yeah. As you can imagine, they weren't paying us very well when it wasn't. Um, uh, I was mopping floors at a auto garage because I'm uh, I grew up around Saab cars. My dad worked for Saab, so I was diving at the aquarium. I was doing oil changes and mopping floors and washing cars at an auto garage, um, all just so I could be in my band. Kind of wondering what I was doing with my life. Um, and when I turned thirty, I I realized I need to make a change. You know, the band probably isn't going to pay the bills. The band probably isn't going to be a, a way for me to live a comfortable life. So I reinvented myself and went back to, or went to, back to college, I guess. Uh, I went to art school, studied at a legendary cartoon graphics school called, called the Kubert School of cartoon art, I guess, basically. So when you were a kid, did you draw? Did you have an interest sure. in drawing? Sure, yeah, so I, I drew as a was, kid. It was in there with the yeah. fish tanks and the... I drew as a kid, like most kids will, you know, will do. Um, I probably did it more than the average kid, and I was maybe a little bit better than those around me. You know, I'd often be the kid in class that was probably the best at drawing, mm -hmm. but... I would often be the one who wasn't there. I had plenty of friends that were to draw circles around me growing up. Um, so it's something I always loved. It's something I always wanted to get better at. Um, I grew up loving comic books, um, collecting them kind of obsessively. And so at this point in my life, I decided I'm going to go be not only an artist, but I'm going to be a comic book artist, which is why I went to the, the Kubert school, which is where you go if you want to be a comic book artist. Um, it's located in Dover, New Jersey, which is a hard little town to adjust to if you've grown up in, yeah. you know, California your whole life. Um, and in doing so, I left my band and the um, all the buzz and kind of success that the ichthyologist record was producing for Giant Squid. Um, and I left my girlfriend, Jackie, now my wife and mother of our two kids. Um, so that was hard to do. Um, but I, I spent a good solid year at the Kubert School, um, did really well, but decided it wasn't the exact path I, w I wanted to go. Um, and so I transferred to the Academy of Art here in San back Francisco. Yep, yeah, moved back to San Francisco. That way the band could get active again. 
I could, you know, Jackie and I could, could be together. Um, and I would also get a degree at that school where Cuber school is vocational. So, um, and that degree gave you credibility to, mm -hmm. to okay. It, it, you know, a lot of people would argue why you would need an art degree, but, uh, it definitely gives you credibility. It enables you to teach, which is something I was always interested in doing. And I now do professionally. Um, and it just figured if I was going to spend that much money, both schools cost about the same amount of money. I should probably have a degree because what if something happens to my hands and I can't draw professionally? You know, I would need that. We need a bachelor's degree to fall back on to maybe get a different kind the, of job. The drawing, but also as a musician, if something happened to your yeah. hands, you wouldn't be able to do that either. Right, right. You know, um, so you never know what may happen in life. Um, it's always good to have you know some backups and. Mm -hmm. Always wanted a college degree, you know. That was something that I had regretted not chasing earlier in life because I was so busy with the fish store and so busy with the bands and all these other kind of really ambitious projects I had in my twenties. Um, took me out of City College in Sacramento, where I was studying marine biology for a minute. Um, so uh, moved back. Actually, where was I at? <laughs> so you came back to San Francisco to go to the Academy of Art? Yep. Okay. Move back. Jackie. Yep. Move back to San Francisco. Academy of Art. Uh, Giant Squid made another record. Um, so the band was really active. We were touring the nation. So we would go out for 30 days and play a show every night from San Diego, California to Portland, Maine. Um, and everything in between. So I've, I've played shows in almost every state in the country. Um, I've been to almost every state in the country, <laughs> obviously, uh, by default. Um, and so we had some really exciting times. Uh, the whole time I was still pursuing school, um, where I eventually graduated uh, in 2014 with a Bachelor's of Fine Art in Illustration. And I was valedictorian of the school, um, which is pretty cool considering yeah, it's the biggest art school in the country. Um, and I think it had been a while since an illustration major had been valedictorian too. So I was especially proud of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And what do they call it? Uh, cum laude. Mm -hmm. If you get, you know, almost straight or whatever, straight A's. My, my GPA was pretty high, so I got that too. Um, go big or go home. Yeah. My. You're very ambitious with all of your thanks. projects. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Towards the end of school, I was already getting published, so I, I had a big, my big breakthrough job was a book called Spirals in Time that I got to illustrate with an amazing, uh, written by an amazing biologist, uh, her name is Dr. Helen Scales from the UK, very hip, upcoming, kind of high profile biologist who's doing TED Talks and all sorts of different kind of seminars and a lot of exposure being on, you know, Science Channel and stuff like that, Nat Geo Channel. She's amazing. So that was my big breakthrough, and that was coming out before I'd even graduated. So that was a pretty huge deal. Um, and so I got out of school, and, and also I, around that time was when we started cotton crustacean. I was about halfway through my school year, my school career. Um, and so I, I hit the ground running right out of art school. Been pursuing cotton crustacean super hard ever since. Um, Helen Scales and I did another book called Eye of the Shoal, which uh, was really successful as well. So Spirals in Time was about animals that create seashells. So basically mollusks in general, past, present, how they've affected humanity, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, and then Eye of the Shoal is the equivalent book to just about fish, you know. Um, so I, I've, I've gotten comic book work. I got to illustrate a Godzilla comic book. Um, I've done tons of record covers for, you know, bands that uh, either I know or some bands I don't know. Um, lots of published work in that regard. I uh, did some stuff for the Smithsonian, which is great. Um, so has a lot of the, the work you've done been um, because of your music background or because of the art background or connecting, networking? It, yeah. Ha it seems like... We were talking about this earlier that that things aren't necessarily connected and then but you've connected them yeah absolutely right so i so i had this this past with fish 
in marine biology, a passion for that, and almost 20 years in that industry. Um, I was playing in a professional band, and then I went to go become a professional artist, and I managed to kind of combine them all. Um, I made the general themes of my music about the natural world, usually oceanic or nautical in, in nature, and our band became really known for that. Um, in many ways, we inspired a lot of other bands to kind of do the same. We were kind of one of the originators of this, which some people will jokingly call shark metal, <laughs> or ocean metal, or, yes. or whale core. You, you brought this this artistic genre to music. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By way of fish. Right. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. I brought, I brought science to music to and scientific illustration in a way to music. And how music then inspired cotton crustacean, or my, my career, I should say, in music inspired cotton crustacean, is when you're in a band and you're playing shows, you have to make t-shirts to sell at those shows. And Giant Squid made plenty of t-shirts, so I had a lot of experience in kind of how to design them and get them set up to take to a screen printer and get a final product back that looked okay, and then sell to our, our fans. So I was already doing that series of, of you know um, techniques I guess kind of mechanisms to, to produce a, a final product um, and dealing with local manufacturers and whatnot um, and then when I had the idea for cotton crustacean it was I wonder if I did a drawing of a kind of a either a trilobite or some kind of cool prehistoric animal that I think our fans would be into because also our band is associated with that kind of a thing I wonder if I made a shirt like that and then just didn't put Giant Squid on it. Didn't make it a band shirt, just made a shirt shirt. <laughs> and sold it at the merch table if people would buy it. And so we, so we did a trilobite drawing. Um, and it sold out within a couple shows. So then I did another you, batch. You knew you were onto something. Yeah, and it sold out. And there was, you know, I, I wasn't having to like sell myself to the fans about the shirt. They would just go, what is that? I'd explain it. Cool, I'll take one of those too. So that led to us thinking, well, I think there might be something here. And we did a Kickstarter campaign um, with a goal to produce four shirts. And our total that we wanted was $2,000 to do that. That's kind of how Kickstarter works, right? You say, we need X amount of money. Help this us. is what we're going to do with it. Yep. This is what you get for it. You got it. Yeah. So if you pledge, you know. And we got almost twelve thousand dollars and you was, wanted two we wanted two you we got almost twelve um so it, it was a big kickstart for the company um, we made a bunch of new designs we did a cool thing where our highest reward tier that you could pledge towards would be you choose whatever animal you want i'll draw it we'll include it into the t-shirt lineup you'll get the original art so you'll get the original piece of the original drawing and you'll get to see your choice become a t-shirt design and of course you'll get free copies of the t-shirt you know um so that I, I think we had like six people choose that i mean it just really shot the yeah. you know it was great so we had all sorts of new designs um we had money and one of the first things we did was we uh having just moved to pacifica about a year and a half before um we set up a booth at Fogfest, and Bought the tent and made the shelves, figured out our whole display. We, we brought in our house plants from our home and put them in the corner to make it homey. <laughs> put a little rug in there from Target, made a little desk. And, you know, we we sold more than like $3,000 worth of shirts in two days. I'd never, I couldn't have imagined that would have happened. Um, and so that was really significant for us. And then... And that was about five years ago. That was about five... Yeah, so this upcoming Fog Fest 2019 will be our sixth Fog Fest, I'm pretty sure. Um, so we did it again the next year with a much more even refined booth. Nice wood shelving and cool signage and mannequins now wearing the shirts, you know, instead of just shirts on like a board. Um, and we did about $5,000 with the sales, which was really blowing our mind. Yeah. And in, about that time, we were starting to get into other shows. So we were doing Maker Fair and the San Mateo Fair, you know, San Mateo Fairground. That um, show was huge. Too. That show was huge. And we did even more money at that show one year that really made us realize there is something here. 
that could be not only just a career, but something that can really sustain the, the whole family can be involved in, you know, um, an actual company, a real family company that, you know, someday maybe my daughters can run if, if we keep it going. Um, and so we started just hitting every show we could, um, little art and craft street fairs, um, uh, super hip boutique, you know, shows, um, I anywhere that would have us. We started exhibiting at Cal Academy, Academy of Sciences in Columbia Park, um, for their nightlife events. And it, 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 if you can imagine it would work, we, we would pr probably done it, you know, um, in the last couple of years, we've gotten into reptile shows. So there's a lot of crossover there. And usually I'm one of only two or three other t-shirt vendors. So there's not a lot of um, competition, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and the reptile community has been really ultra accepting and friendly. And um, I'm starting to do custom designs for a lot of the different companies and stuff. Branding. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm starting to do branding, logo design, t-shirt designs for many of these reptile vendors. You know, whether they're dry goods vendors, so they're selling equipment, or they're breeders, and so they're making, you know, creating exotic snakes in their garage. Um, yeah, there's a lot of excitement there right now um, with us in that community. So, um, she just did this design for the San Jose Reptile Show.